everyone, my name is Kyla. Welcome to my channel where I talk about the stock market and the economy amongst other things. A lot has happened since I last made a video. I'm going to be discussing two of my past newsletters, talking about GDP, talking about economic growth, and of course, talking about recessions. I've done a lot of work on recessions and vibe sessions, et cetera. So if you want to go check that out, I have videos on it. I've written about it. I have TikToks on it. You don't want like the more philosophical outlook. I'm going to mark out where I do talk a little bit more about markets, but I do think it's important to talk about like the human side of this, the philosophical side of it. There's a lot of types of differentials, right? So there's experience and that's a difference between what we're used to and what is happening. So there are inherent expectations that are being challenged by supply chain malfunctioning, higher cost of production and shortages. There are qualitative and quantitative parts of numbers, how it represents one thing, but means another. When we talk about CPI, mortgage rates, oil prices, et cetera, numbers are numbers, but they carry different meanings for different people. If you see inflation at 9.1%, but personally feel like it's 20% because of your lived experience, shortages at the grocery store and your rent going up by $1,000, that's going to create a fair amount of pain. And then there's a so there is no difference between grief and love. <laughs> Oh man, on a market channel, what are we doing? So this is a really great quote from somebody named Jamie Anderson. And she's like a mommy blogger, but she said, grief is really just love. It's all the love that you want to give, but cannot. All that unspent love gathers up in the corners of your eyes, the lump in your throat, and in that hollow part of your chest. Grief is just love with no place to go. The reason that I want to highlight these three seemingly random things is because they all boil down to emotion caused by something happening. Basically, there's all these things that are happening and it's all sort of like emotions. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> but I do think it's important to really zoom out and be like, what? Because things are that should be are broken by how things actually are. Numbers represent things, but mean different things to different people. Some emotions are essentially the same thing, like grief and love, but they're expressed differently. We live in a world where everything is not what we thought it was going to be, which I think is just life. So the differentials described above matter because they influence how we experience the world. It's like this Mario game where things can be the same. Inflation is 9.1% for everybody, but it's actually completely different for different people. 9.1% means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. I also think that we're speed running a lot of problems right now, a pandemic, war, shortages, supply chain breakdowns. So the White House sent a message out this week that the definition of a recession is not two quarters of declining GDP growth because it's not, which sent a lot of people up into an uproar because it makes sense. Like people have been getting this wrong for a long time. Educational institutions, journalists will use two cues as shorthand, which creates confusion when people find out it's not true. And it's actually this council of elders called NBER that decides if we're in a recession. I have TikTok videos on it. A common misconception is that a recession is defined as two quarters of negative GDP. GDP growth. That's just not true. This is Inbert. They're actually the group that determines if we're in a recession. And the way that they define a recession is a significant decline in economic activity that is spread across the economy and lasts more than a few months. They look at depth, they look at diffusion, they look at duration. And we actually had a recession in February of 2020 that lasted only about a month. So you can't actually use that two quarter metric to determine if we're in a recession because we've had recessions that are shorter than that, right? Through the variables that they look at, like personal income, payroll employment, retail sales, it's more than just GDP metrics to determine if we're in a recession. Go to Fred.com to see what they're looking at. And towards the end of the page, they actually say, they say that it is not two consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth. <laughs> they say that does happen, right? It, it does correlate to that, but that is not the definition. Joe asked an important question a few days ago, what additional info is revealed by designating it as a recession or not? Of course, the answers are things like political blame, labels, sticking it to the man, media cycles, vindication. None of that matters. We do have two quarters of declining GDP growth. Things are not Good. We are in an economic slowdown. That much is clear. Now it's the most important how we move forward. One thing I've been thinking about a lot lately is how metrics aren't what we think that they are. The market slash economy is not what we think it always has been because of the pandemic war supply chain meltdown that has shifted how things work and thus really should shift how we measure things. The lens through which we view our economic world quantitatively is just kind of archaic. The economy has evolved even with the GDP recession argument. There's a point to be made that GDP doesn't fully reflect how our economy has changed in this social media hyper online tech driven world. Matt Klein wrote about this back in May, nearly 1 trillion of economic activity is missing from US GDP numbers. The point is that crucial elements of the headline US economic data are somehow wrong. My strong suspicion is that existing methods for tracking capital spending by American businesses on both physical and intangible assets are failing to capture what companies are actually doing. As Cardiff Garcia wrote back in 2015, a lot of attention has been given to methodological issues with the inputs that generate growth statistics 
statistics these past couple of years. The difficulty of properly accounting for services in an economy that is increasingly dominated by them. Our economy has changed, but our methodology hasn't. There are two ways to look at economy go up, GDI or GDP. GDI versus GDP is important in the sense that they both measure two different things that should get to the same sum, economic activity. GDI is more focused on income, wages, profits, interest, income, whereas GDP is more focused on expenditures, consumer spending, government spending, etc. They should be the same number, but they are not. And of course, the core answer for the divergence is that GDP is not being measured accurately, which is weird. Like, whoa, what? <laughs> Numbers are weird and they're weird everywhere, which impacts analysis. There's this great research paper called Missing Financial Data that walks through how to manage a loss of financial data from large firms. Things are only as complete as they can be, and they're often not that complete. Other metrics, so Dion from the Wall Street Journal has a really great video walking through how some other market indicators beyond GDP show how the market is pricing in a recession. A good one is the corporate bond market distress index, which tracks the flows of bonds and showing distress because the bond market is a bit spooked out. Bond market gets spooked out. That means companies are spooked out and the dominoes tip. He also mentioned the inverted yield curve, which going back to the numbers are weird. If we are in a recession, this indicator actually didn't work this time around. And that carries important implications for how we think about everything. That's why I write about vibes so much and talk about them so much, because at the end of the day, expectations of people are the most important thing. Powell is a press conference to let people know that what's going on. We yell online because we're mad about people and both GDI and GDP, et cetera, are driven by the actions of people. But what are the numbers saying? Of, of course, numbers mattered because they dictate narrative. GDP came in weak the other day, falling 0.9% with personal consumption growing only 1% and with consumer spending making up 70% of the economy. That's pretty concerning. The biggest drag on GDP was residential investment, which largely measures housing. And the BIS is a great paper on how the fall in housing right, has consistently anticipated economic downturns. And that felt that number fell 14%. That's not great. And the numbers point out one thing. It's just not good out there. And of course, these numbers will be revised. And NBR looks at more than just GDP growth to determine if we're in a recession. And there were some positive signs in the numbers that they look at. But you know, the question is, so if we're not in a recession or if we're in a recession, what next, dude? Like one of the main reasons that we're not in a recession is because the labor market is strong. There are a lot of arguments to be made about that too. Like unemployment is a lagging indicator. People are getting second jobs. Labor force isn't robust, but it's still like a relatively strongest labor market right now. We got jobless claims the other day and those are flashing red though. The whole labor market is beginning to show soft spots, which definitely makes the whole are we in a recession argument more powerful. And companies are like, hey, it's getting rough out here. Walmart and other retailers are entering this weird matrix of inflation becoming deflationary as they lower the prices on apparel because the consumer dollar is going towards needs instead of wants right now. Walmart had terrible earnings this week and they're like, we're going to have to cut the prices on all our apparel because people are demanding too many needs instead of going after wants. People want food. They need gasoline. But that underscores well is this like consumeristic hole that we've nudged ourselves into where we have endless Walmart shirts, but might struggle getting necessities. That's a pretty bizarre world. But of course, pricing power like McDonald's and Coca-Cola are doing great because they're able to pass off costs to consumers, which doesn't help consumer confidence or the vibes at all. Visa was like, people are definitely out here spending money. Home prices are spiking, but slowing contrasted against the American dream. The American dream is to like have this white picket fence, you know, two-story house with a lawn that should be more biodiverse, but the HOA won't allow it. The dream is no longer achievable in the same way that it used to be, where the expectations for what we can achieve and what we would achieve are changing. Home prices are up 41% over the past two years. Mortgage rates are up 50% since the first part of this year, and the cost of building a home is still really high. There are signs of recovery with record number of homes under construction and higher inventory levels, but it's still like oof. There seems to be different economies. Tech is going through a series of layoffs where manufacturing can't find enough workers. Everything reverts to its simplest form in times of crisis. And so what is the Fed doing? So the Fed has demand-side tools for supply-side problems. We've talked about this a lot. They raised rates by 75 basis points yesterday, getting a bit closer to neutral with the main goal of realigning supply and demand. Once again, you know, fast and furious. The Fed is zooming along in the face of a slowing economy, which they highlighted in their press release. Financial conditions have tightened. Energy costs are still super high. And we're starting to see this weakness in the labor market. The risk now is that the Fed doesn't blink because they're so focused on getting inflation down, which could result in a severe downturn. They said that they're going to continue raising rates, but the bond market is like, mm, no, you won't. <laughs> Kathy Jones said when the Fed hikes rates into a slowing economy, bond yields are going to fall. The more that they hike, the lower that they will go. The Fed could lose some credibility, which is never a good thing in the art of managing expectations. The other worry is that stronger dollars. The Fed continues to hike, the dollar acts as a safe haven, but a stronger dollar puts a lot of pressure on emerging market nations and 
their dollar denominated debt, which makes the Fed's domestic policy very international. The stock market is happy because it thinks bad economic data means the Fed is going to slow down hikes, and that means that stocks can go back to ripping. But as discussed earlier, things are not always how they used to be, right? It's not just monetary policy. And good news, fiscal policy finally stepped up. Department of Energy got some tools unlocked. And secondly, they passed this Inflation Reduction Act, which will provide support to energy and healthcare costs, which is huge. We need a way to invest in clean energy production so we're not blowing up the earth in 40 years trying to get more oil out of the ground. And we need to make sure that people are not dying because they cannot afford insulin. You should want your tax dollars to go towards things that make the world a better place to live in. Employee America wrote a great paper on this to state the obvious productive capital formation and maintenance are critical to achieving lower inflation over the long term. There's a lot of short-term thinking around long-term problems. There are a few important points to make about the energy crisis. So what happened? Europe became really reliant on Russian gas indirectly-ish because Europe decided to shift to renewable energy and shut down nuclear plants, leaving Russia as the energy source of last resort. You cannot have green energy policy without green energy investment, which is the very hard lesson that they're learning now. So what is happening now? Russia now has Europe in a chokehold. Nord Stream, the main pipeline from Russia into Germany, was shut down for maintenance, and it is expected to reopen in a sort of reopening, but flows are major down, down to less than 30% of the average from 2016 to 2021. The energy demands have only increased since then, but supply has shrunk massively, meaning there still isn't enough gas. Europe needs to diversify away from Russia sooner rather than later. Russia also has China and India and the US because of how the dominoes tip, with oil going to China and India 30% below peak. China is going through their own property crisis compounded by financial instability and social unrest, and there are calls to diversify away trade from them. But that has its own consequences, right? Janet Yellen calls it French shoring, but she's also trying to get China to participate in price cap on Russian oil. Friendships and alliances mean two different things. So why is this bad? Europe needs more gas for winter. And that's really what is concerning is that there won't be enough energy to keep people warm. Gazprom, the main Russian gas company, declared force majeure and basically was like, one day we might not deliver gas and that's that. So this will impact Europe's economic growth with estimates of a 1.5% GDP drop and a knock-on effect to growth in the United States. The world is dominoes. It will also impact how companies fund themselves as European companies cancel debt deals. And people's lives, of course. Like this creates a fertilizer shortage because as natural gas prices increase, fertilizer prices increase because of that. And that compounds into food shortage as less fertilizer hits the fields, which has obvious consequences. The IEA came out with a five-step plan to help manage this energy crisis and basically boiled down to stop demanding so many things, everybody, and let's coordinate. But that's really putting out fire with a toy bucket. The whole energy crisis is challenging how we normally operate. Speaking with a broad brush, we're used to having energy prices be tolerable and gas prices are going back down here at the United States. But this energy crisis is a big deal. It's a challenge to the common denominator of everything. We need alternatives like nuclear, as Japan is doing and Germany is considering immediately. It's a combination of stepping backwards, realizing that we need to prepare for a changing economic regime, but that does not mean completely abandoning the idea of progress. We've already seen the consequences of a lack of investment sparked by the pandemic. Inflation is caused by a lot of things, including not preparing for the future. Daniel Altman wrote a great piece for foreign policy called Fix This Economy Now, highlighting how we can make our economy better. Reinvest in workers and students. Provide basic necessities to our kids, like food. Invest more. Golden rule budgeting. Sovereign wealth fund, as well as hybrid income and wealth taxes are, are super valuable for how we move forward. The main point of the article was thinking differently about things. We need to do that. We kind of get stuck in these corrals, limit how far we can see to either side of us. It's not always about moving forward, but sometimes about moving laterally too. We need to understand the scope of the problems that we face. And that's more than just GDP coming in negative. It's our future and our present and making sure our kids get nutrition they need at school. We should make sure that kids have food and making sure that our people have the training and support they need to make the world a better place to be. I think one thing that really bugs me, <laughs> bugs me <laughs> about the discourse is that we get so caught up in what things are is that we forget what they mean. Housing costs are skyrocketing, specifically rent, and they likely won't come back down unless policy is put in place. And that's actually circling back to GDP because decline in residential investment was actually a large driver of the fall in GDP. So if you make an investment in policy, your economy is going to grow a little bit better. Of course, you know, there's headwinds. Many people don't experience the economy and GDP growth, right? You're going to experience it in food costs and gasoline, the cost of rent. Like you're not going to be like, oh, right, yeah, trade was great. It all boils down. 
But you know, we always tend to forget that people doing okay is the core goal of basically everything. We have to start rethinking how we think about things, analyzing the tools that we have and the frameworks that we implement, and perhaps trading them in for something different. The world is always changing, always moving, always doing something. It's good because then there's more to build. A stagnant pool is not the best place to be, but it's bad because the expectations are no longer reality, which creates cognitive dissonance. Going back to the point about grief and love being the same thing, there are a lot of ways to think about what is happening, just like how we all process grief and love differently, even if we are expressing the same emotions. We all process the emotion that arises from all this economic stuff differently too. Our brains are built to process the negative first because that's what helps us plan for future survival. We remember the threats because they're threats to our existence. The animalistic part of our brain ruminates on that. One of my favorite books is Dancing After Hours. It's an exploration of normalcy, how people exist in the world. There's one section that talks about the shopping cart theory. There's something about taking the cart back instead of leaving it in the parking lot, she said. I don't know when this came to me. It was a few years ago. There's a difference between leaving it where you empty it and taking it back to the front of the store. It's significant because somebody has to take them in. Yes. And if you know that you will do it for that one guy, you do something else. You join the world. You move out of your isolation and become universal. I think we are increasingly forgetting about our commonalities. Many have explored the disintegration of communities that has come with suburbanization and social mediaization, but it's in becoming increasingly stark. There's a paper from 2013 called The Strange Disappearance of Cooperation in America. And a lot of parts of it still ring true. What we have then is a strange disappearance of cooperation at all levels within the American society, from the neighborhood bowling leagues to the national level economic and political institutes. What's worse, it's disappearing from our lexicon. We're breaking away from each other. This is not a novel thing. As the piece outlines, this has happened in many different empires. Polarization is bad. It leads to less progress and eventually stagnation and so on and so forth. There's an element of figuring out how to tap into what people are passionate about and giving them the space to explore that. There's an element of realizing that there's both good and bad always. Of course, we will hurt each other. Other, but this is the very condition of existence. To become spring means accepting the risk of winter. To become presence means accepting the risk of absence. And finally, an element of realizing that bad things are good in a way that we don't always understand, that they carry lessons, although painful. You're not a monster, I said, but I lied. What I really wanted to say was that a monster was not such a terrible thing to be. To be a monster is to be a hybrid signal, a lighthouse, both shelter and warning at once. Grief and love are the same emotion expressed differently. We're living in a world of increasing differentials where our base case is becoming less probable and we're having to build our new models of thinking. That is exciting, but that's so scary. We might be all experiencing the derivative of the same thing as our economic world changes around us, but it shows up for all of us differently. And that's important to remember. So this was two newsletters and they will be linked below. I'm on Substack. I'm on Instagram. I'm on TikTok. I'm on Twitter. I'm on LinkedIn. And I hope that you all are doing okay. And I will talk to you all soon. Bye.